Good morning, it's Scream Distiller. I'm starting a new series about dynamic programming. This first video will just be the basics, but I tend to go into intermediate and advanced DP as well. So in this video, I'm just going to talk about what is dynamic programming and the thought patterns that are useful for thinking about DP and time memory complexity analysis and implementation. Okay, so what is dynamic programming? Well, first you can uh, forget tables and recursive functions and memorization and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna drop a truth bomb on you here. Dynamic programming is about making subproblems and identifying those subproblems with the state and combining the subproblems together to make the solution to a bigger problem. And that's it. And there's lots of different ways you can think about this and how it works, but that's the fundamental idea behind dynamic programming. So to talk about dynamic programming, let's first start with an example. So I'm going to give you a classic dynamic programming problem called minimum coin change. And the problem goes like so. We have some types of coins, right? So let's say we have two cents, three cents, and five cents. Given these denominations of coins, and we can use each denomination of coin as many times as we want, for a particular monetary value, so let's say you want to make 10 cents. What's the minimum number of coins you need to make 10 cents? So in this case, five plus five is 10. So we use two five cent pieces and the minimum number of coins required is two. So why is this related to DP? Well, this has a sub problem, right? A sub problem is, can we make X cents? And what's the minimum number of coins that are required? And it also has the other property of DP, which is we can combine the sub problems. And this is the key observation, right? So if I tell you that you can make 10 cents using two coins, uh, you don't have to know like what those coins are. But if I then ask you, can you make 15 cents? And what do you think the minimum number of coins required is? Well, you know it's going to be three or fewer, right? So three is the upper bound because you can just add a five to 10, use one extra coin and you got 15. Could be lower than three, but you can reuse the answer to this subproblem to make the answers to bigger problems. Now I'm going to explain DP in maybe a different way than you've heard it explained before in terms of directed acyclic graphs. So if you don't know, a directed acyclic graph is it's a graph and the edges between nodes have a direction and you can't have any cycles. I, you can't start from one node and then go on like some path and get back to the same node. So this is not a directed acyclic graph because you have this uh, cycle here. So have a think about this. All dynamic programming problems can be represented using directed acyclic graphs and all directed acyclic graphs can be thought of as dynamic programming problems. So let's apply this to the minimum coin change problem. So let's say that the nodes are a coin value and the minimum number of coins it takes to make that value. So we know one immediately, right? zero cents and it takes zero coins to make that so that's like the base case now from zero coins if we've got the three denominations right we got uh, two three and five but we can try using each one of these coins here so two three five so now we can make two cents using one coin or we can make three cents using one coin or we can make five cents using one coin and we can keep going, right? So if we use two and we add two cents to it, we can make four cents using two coins. And now here's where it gets interesting, right? So two cents, and then we add a three cent piece, we get five cents, which already exists in the graph. Let's draw an arrow to there. And that's three cents. We already know that we can make five cents uh, with one coin. But if we use a two cent piece and we use a three cent piece, that's our two coins. So that's not particularly useful. We want the minimum number of coins. What you can see is that each node represents a sub problem. Can I make this value? And what's the minimum number of coins? And each node and the edge that connects it to another node represents the way that we use the sub problems to make the answer to larger problems. So if we're trying, if we're at this uh, five node here, and we're trying to figure out what's the minimum number of coins. Well, if we look at every edge that's coming into five, we can say, oh, it takes one coin if we start from zero and it takes two coins if we start from two. So we can compute this 
solve problems answer as the mirror number of coins out of all the possible states that could reach this node. And you can see that this is going to be acyclic because every time we follow an edge, it adds a positive value to the coin value, which means that if we were to come around to the same node, that means we were, would have had to add a zero total money, which can't happen because all of our coin denominations are positive. So let me just fill out a bit more of this example. Here we can use a two here and also get to five. And from two, we can add a five and get to seven, right? So seven using two coins. And from five, we can also get to seven by using a two. And from three, we can get to six. <laughs> and grass getting a little messy. So that's all DP is. It's representing a way to compute the solution to your problem as a graph that contains the subproblems as nodes and the way to compute the answers to larger subproblems using previous nodes that you've, that you've computed. And then at the end, say we wanted to know the answer to like seven, for example, you just look in that node and you have the minimum number of coins. We saw how to uh, think about DPs as a type of directed acyclic graph, but there are multiple ways to think about dynamic programming or what it is. And like, depending on the person, like one way will be uh, easier to understand, one way will be harder to understand. So here's a, a different way. It's a bit more common, I think, but it's the state recurrence subproblem kind of way of thinking about DP. First, what you do is you define a subproblem. So in the case of minimum coin change, it's what's the minimum number of coins I can uh, use to make this value. And then you figure out a way to represent that state. In minimum coin change, you can just represent that state by a value. So making like 15 cents, for example. And then you find a way to compose the results of our smaller subproblems into a larger answer or answer for a larger subproblem. And the way you do that is you use a recurrence relation. So the recurrence relation is just like the inside of this function that computes the answer to the subproblem. And it's going to have base case, right? So if x is equal to zero, well, there's one way to create zero cents. And that's just uh, using no coins at all. And then all we need to do is just go through all the types of coins that we have. And we say like, oh, if we use this coin and assuming we already know the answer to f of x minus d, where d is the coin we're using, then that's like a potential way we can make x cents, right? We just used five cents, for example, we just used two cents. So we can just loop through all the denominations. So let's say d is an array with the denomination. And if we just say, we take the minimum of f of x minus d, and then plus one, because we just used a coin with a value d, versus all the other coins that we could try. And then we return m at the end. An important thought pattern in dp is you assume you already know the answer to the subproblem when you're using inside the recurrence relation. So like, oh, we already know what f of x minus d is because it's a smaller coin value and we assume we've already computed it. And we use those smaller already computed values to compute the answer to larger subproblems. So how do we work out the time and memory complexity of a DP algorithm? Well, the key point is that we don't compute the answer to a particular subproblem more than once. So if we already know that uh, f of 15, so what's the minimum number of coins it takes to make uh, 15 cents, if we already know that answer, we don't run the function again, right? We save it. And this is called uh, memoization. Another, another key point is that the subproblems have to have like a, some degree of overlap in there in the other states they use. So in minimum coin change, if we're trying to work out the answer for seven cents, we could uh, use uh, five cents and two cents, or we could use two, two cents and a three cents. And they, they both make us seven cents, but we don't care about the internal structure of how that seven cents is made, right? And this is what allows the DP algorithm to be faster. And another way to think about this is in terms of the directed acyclic graph. So let's say we have some arbitrarily complicated directed acyclic graph, right? So we've got like this, and like this goes here. And each of these nodes represents a subproblem and the answer to that subproblem. And the edges represent the recurrence solution. So the current solution is here in the functional uh, construction of DP. And then here's the state. And the state is a way of representing uh, what the subproblem is. In order to compute, say, this node, we need the answer to this node, right? That's why there's an edge there. But 
in order to compute the answer to this top node here, well, there are no in edges coming into it, so we can compute it immediately. And this sort of corresponds to like a base case. So in minimum coin change example, right, this is a zero, zero. And let's say that we compute the answer to this. So we computed it. Now we can try removing this from the directory cyclic graph. And now all the things that we can now compute after that, uh, not this one, this one has an arrow here, all now have no in edges, right? They have no dependencies that haven't been computed. And actually this is a, a topological slot. If you don't know what a topological slot is, I'll probably explain it in another video. But DP, uh, you need to find some order to compute the subproblems. And you can solve any DP by representing it as a directly cyclic graph, then doing a top sort and then computing the sub problems in that order. It's just usually um, the recurrence relation isn't that complicated that you have to like do that kind of stuff. So let's go back to looking at uh, this functional representation. When we're analyzing the time complexity of DP, we have the assumption that all the sub problems that this depends on, we've already computed those. So normally, you try to call like this F, right? And you do like some recursive thing and like who knows how long it takes. But in DP, we say, this is constant time when we're doing the analysis. We've already computed this and that makes the analysis so much easier. All we're doing here is a order D loop where D is the number of denominations of coins. And how many times do we do that order D work? Well, let's say that the maximum uh, coin value that we want to make is N. That means that this X can go from uh, zero all the way up to N, right? So for each of those uh, N states, we're doing order D work. So the overall time complexity is order n d. You can see this uh, easily on the DAG. We have n nodes, and for each node, we potentially have to look at d edges coming into it. So each node takes order d work, there are n nodes, multiply those two things, n d. And in general, to compute the complexity of dp, all you do is you get the number of possible states, and you multiply it by the time complexity of the recurrence relation. So it, it, it's uh, super easy to work out the time complexity for DP usually. So how are DPs actually implemented uh, IRL? Well, there's a few ways. There's top down and bottom up. And within bottom up, there's like a fill forward and a fill backward. I'm not sure if those are the correct names, but like these concepts do exist. So this one here is the top down. And what that means is that it uses a recursive function and it starts from the biggest subproblem, and then it uses recursive function calls to solve the smaller subproblems, and then it stores the answers via memoization in like an array or something. And did anyone notice this case was missing from the previous slides? I uh, don't want to miss this case, otherwise when you memorize, it's going to explode. And it will also just give the wrong answer too. So let's have a look at this top-down case. We got our base cases. We can't make negative amounts of money making zero coin a uh, zero value make take zero coins and now here's some new code this is called memorization we so store a sentinel value in array so this array is full of negative ones to begin with and negative one is not a valid answer to how many coins we can use so we know that if this is negative one it means we haven't seen the state before if it isn't negative one we have seen it we've already computed the value and we can just return otherwise we compute it normally and we save it into this array, so it'll be used later, and return that value. The advantage of top-down is usually it's easier to reason about because it follows the process of thinking of a DP more closely. You start off with a big sub-problem and you break it up, whereas bottom-up is more like taking smaller sub-problems and putting them together, which is a little harder to think about, although it depends on the person. Another good thing about top-down is you don't have to think about the order that you evaluate the sub-problems. The uh, recursive nature will mean that it will just keep on going down until it gets to like a base case or something that's already computed, and then it will use that value. With bottom-up, just like with like the DAG formulation of DP, you need to think about the order in which you compute the sub-problems, and you need to make sure that all of the dependencies for computing a larger sub-problem are already computed when you go to compute it. So let's have a look at this one. This is bottom-up, and it is... Uh, fill backward. And what I mean by fill backward is that we're at a particular state X, right? And then we look at previous states that we know we've already computed. For minimum coin change, it's pretty easy because if we just go from smaller values to higher values, uh, we only ever look at values that are smaller than us. So we know they're already computed if we compute from smallest to highest. 
And for bottom up, we usually chuck the base case inside uh, this array when we initialize it and the rest are like set to some central value or like whatever, right? Now we do basically the same recurrence as the top down. We go through all of the uh, denominations. Uh, we check that we're not accessing out of bounds of the array that corresponds to this base case here in the top down. And then we just say, using x take d coins plus a, a d coin, is it better than what we already have here? And at the end, the answer is just going to be inside a mem of n, where n is the value that we're trying to make. So that's, we're here and we're looking behind us for stuff we've already computed. There's also another way you can do it, and it's fill forward. And with this one, we're like, we're at this state. What can we do from this state and how does it affect states that we're going to compute later? So in this case, we still have this uh, base case here. We initialize everything to infinity. And instead of looping from our one to n inclusive, we loop from our zero to n take one. And we look at all the denominations of coins and we say, we're at x. If we use this coin d, uh, make sure that it's not too big first, otherwise we'll crash. Otherwise, uh, we kind of like gradually compute a better and better answer for uh, x, uh, x plus d, right? It's either what it currently is, if it's better than where we are plus this uh, d coin here. And I mean, these two things are the same. They compute the same values, but depending on the exact DP, one of these might be easier or harder to think of or to code. So it's kind of just like preference. Usually I code a top down if it'll run in time. There is some additional overhead from uh, like the function calls and like the memory contiguity, right? So with bottom up, uh, the memory accesses tend to be more local and that's better on uh, actual existing hardware. Those memory access will be faster. Top down, like the states are accessed a bit more randomly, so it might be a bit slower. In general, I code a top down if I can, because uh, it's easy to think of and faster for me to code, but uh, bottom up is uh, good as well. And sometimes you need to code a bottom up uh, if you're trying to optimize memory, for example. As a follow up to this, I made a video of me just like solving random um, at coder easy DP problems with commentary. That may be useful if you watch this video and you're still like, uh, how do I implement DP, like actually IRL. And in this DP series, I'll also be covering intermediate and advanced DP, where intermediate and advanced is like some arbitrary definition that I thought of. And this will cover like uh, types of DPs you often see and like uh, techniques that can be used for those DPs. All right, thanks for watching.